every four years, the United States goes through the ritual of electing a president. I use the term ritual for two reasons. First, most Americans' understanding of the election process is based on customer right rather than the law. Second, most of the customs Americans follow directly contradict the actual process of electing a president of the United States. So we'll take a closer look at this practice next on the Constitution Study. Hello there, Everyday Americans, Paul Hingley of the Constitution Study, where we read, study the Constitution, teach the rising generation to be free. I'm glad you could join me today in another episode talking about elections. We've talked about primaries, and I'll probably talk some more as the year goes on, but we're dealing with a presidential election, and it's important that we understand what's actually going on, what will actually happen as you go through this choice of making, a, of selecting a president. The details matter, and I want to get into them. So we'll talk more about the website and other things at the end of the episode. Right now, let's get into this process of electing a president. Many years ago, I was in Raleigh, North Carolina, working on a project with an international team. Every day, the whole team would go out for lunch. Now, since it was a presidential election year and I was the only American on the team, I was asked about the apparently convoluted process of electing an American president. This was before I had begun studying the Constitution, so... I explained the process as best as I could on the customs that I had been taught. Today, my answer would not only be more coherent, it would also include references to the actual laws it was based on. The first and probably most fundamental misunderstanding most Americans have about the presidential election process is the belief that they vote for president. They do not. According to Article 2, Section 1, Clause 2 of the Constitution, each state shall appoint in such manner as the legislature thereof may direct a number of electors equal to the whole number of senators and representatives to which the state may be entitled in the Congress. So like primaries, before 1964 and the ratification of the 24th Amendment, the idea of the people voting for president did not exist in the Constitution. The right of the citizens of the United States to vote in any primary or other elections for president or vice president, for electors for president or vice president, or for senator or representatives in Congress shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or any state by reason of failure to pay any poll tax or other tax. In fact, the 24th Amendment didn't say that the people voted for president, only that they could not be denied the right to vote in such an election for failing to pay taxes. Yet another example of the lack of understanding of the Constitution by Congress in the several states. The reporting of a national popular vote for president is another lie, since there is no such thing. The people do not elect the president. The states do. Now, based on Article 2, Section 1, the states have established the manner of appointing electors to be based on a popular vote in the state for a political party. The details may vary from state to state, but the general process is the same. Each political party puts together a slate of party faithful who pledge to vote for their party's candidate. When the state puts together the ballot, they list the party candidates. In the past, most states noted that you were voting for electors for that candidate, although recently that has changed. In the 2020 election, 37 of the 50 states, that's 74%, lie on the ballots, claiming that their citizens are voting for the actual president and vice president, even though they aren't. So even when the ballot tells you the vote is for electors for president, what you're actually voting for are pre-selected operatives of a specific party. After Election Day in November, each state determines which slate of electors to appoint. From the 12th Amendment, we read, The electors shall meet in their respective states and vote by ballot for president and vice president, one of whom at least shall not be an inhabitant of the same state with themselves. These electors meet in their state on the first Tuesday after the second Wednesday in December, according to Title III of the United States Code, Section 7. This is the only federal or national election in the United States. While elections for the House and Senate are for federal offices, they are still state elections. Some states require their electors to vote based on the results of their state's election. However, in some states, the penalty for not voting based on the state's popular vote 
may not be all that significant, which has led for some to call for electors to be unfaithful to their pledge in an attempt to win the election. Actually, the presidential electors cast two ballots, one for president and one for vice president, as required by the 12th Amendment. They shall name in their ballots the person voted for as president, and in distinct ballots the person voted for as vice president, and they shall make distinct lists of all persons voted for as president, and of all persons voted for as vice president, and of the number of votes for each, which list they shall sign and certify and transmit sealed to the seat of the government of the United States directed to the president of the Senate. Since most state laws appoint their electors in a winner-take-all manner, all the electors vote unanimously for their party's candidates. These electors are party apparatchik, so they, they simply vote for their party's ticket, which was established through a combination of primary elections and other internal political machinations. Once the electors have done their duty to their political party, the list of a single name for president and another for vice president is signed, certified, and sent to the sitting vice president in their role as president of the Senate. Next comes the counting of the votes of the presidential electors. This has been codified into law by Section 15 of Title III of the United States Code. According to the 12th Amendment, the process starts with the President of the Senate opening the certificates to be counted. The President of the Senate shall, in the presence of the Senate and House of Representatives, open all the certificates and the vote shall then be counted. Sounds simple enough. When does this counting happen? Well, from Title III, Section 15 of the U.S. Code, Congress shall be in session on the 6th day of January, succeeding every meeting of the electors. The Senate and House of Representatives shall meet in the Hall of the House of Representatives at the hour of 1 o'clock in the afternoon on that day, and the President of the Senate shall be their presiding officer. Now, according to the 12th Amendment, the only role the President of the Senate has during this session is to open the certificates and have them counted. Congress confirmed this in subsection B of section 15. Except as otherwise provided in this chapter, the role of the President of the Senate while presiding over the joint session shall be limited to performing solely ministerial duties. The President of the Senate shall have no power to solely determine, accept, reject, or otherwise adjudicate or resolve disputes over the proper certificate of assessment of appointments of electors, the validity of electors, or the votes of electors. Sadly, this is where Congress has begun to interfere with the election process. At the joint session of the Senate and House of Representatives described in subsection A, there shall be present two tellers previously appointed on the part of the Senate and two tellers previously appointed on the part of the House of Representatives by the presiding officers of the respective chambers. Yes, this is a minor point. The Constitution doesn't say how the votes are to be counted. After all, I guess it would assume a group of intelligent men could figure out how to safely and accurately count the votes. Congress, on the other hand, wanted their input on the process. If you read the 12th Amendment, you see Congress has no role in the presidential election unless none of those voted for in office receive a majority. See, contrary to all the January 6th rhetoric, Congress does not certify the election. Let me say that again. Contrary to all of the rhetoric around January 6th, Congress does not certify the election of the president. Here we see that Congress has decided for themselves that they will pick the tellers who will count the votes. Uh, that's not the only ways Congress has decided to interfere in the election. It starts with a subtle point. The president of the Senate shall open their certificates and papers purporting to be certificates of the votes of electors appointed pursuant to a certificate of assessment of appointment of electors issued pursuant to Section 5 in the alphabetic order of the states, beginning with the letter A. And, upon opening any certificate, hand the certificate and any accompanying papers to the tellers who shall then read the same in the presence and hearing of the two houses. What are these purported certificates? See, the Constitution says nothing about purported certificates. The Twelfth Amendment says the President of the Senate will open the certificates he has received from the states and have them counted. So what does this Section 5 say? Not later than the date, that is six days before the time fixed for the meeting of the electors, the executive of each state shall issue a certificate of ascertainment of appointment of electors under and in pursuance of the laws of such state, providing for such appointment and ascertainment enacted prior to Election Day. Now, who the state electors are is none of the United States' business. It is solely a state matter. 
I suppose the reasoning behind sending the list of electors to the archivist of the United States is to allow fake certificates to be identified and not counted. In fact, federal law claims to establish a rather complicated process for the sending of the certificates from the electors to the president of the Senate and others. The problem is the Constitution does not delegate to Congress the authority to tell states they have to register their electors with the United States or to have their certificates be sent anywhere but the president of the Senate. That's not all of Congress's interference in the election. Upon the reading of each certificate or paper, the president of the Senate shall call for objections, if any. Again, the Constitution does not give Congress any say in counting of the presidential electoral votes. They are there only to observe and act if necessary. So what are the reasons Congress thinks it can object? The only grounds for objections shall be as follows. The electors of the state were not lawfully certified under a certificate of ascertainment of appointment of electors according to Section 5A1. The vote of one or more electors has not been regularly given. Remember back to January 6, 2021? There were several states that did not lawfully appoint electors, not because of some law made up by Congress, but because the manner of appointing them was modified by state courts or the state's secretary of state, not the legislature. Those objections, though, should have been dealt with at the state level, not with Congress. With the election process dominated, in many cases controlled, by the two major parties, it seems fairly unlikely that a candidate would not receive the votes of a majority of the electors, as required by the 12th Amendment. The person having the greatest number of votes for president shall be the president if such number be a majority of the whole number of electors appointed. However, as dissatisfaction with the two dominant parties grows, this becomes more and more a possibility. There are two things the American people should be aware of should such a situation happen. First, the president or vice president needs to have the votes of majority of the electors appointed. Should a state fail to legally appoint electors, as happened in 2020, not only should their votes not have been submitted to the president of the Senate, but should not be considered when determining a majority. Second, when no candidate receives a majority, then the decision of who will be president devolves to the House of Representatives and the vice president to the Senate. And if no person have such majority, then from the persons having the highest number, not exceeding three on the list of those voted for as president, the House of Representatives shall choose immediately by ballot the president. But in choosing the president, the votes shall be taken by states, the representation from each state having one vote. A quorum for this purpose shall consist of a member or members of two-thirds of the states, and a majority of all the states shall be necessary to a choice. In the case of the House choosing a president, the state delegations vote by ballot. That means each state gets a single vote. Since the Congress is seated before the votes of the president are counted, and the partisanship that exists in both houses is so rampant, the choice would ultimately be decided by the majority in each state's delegation in the House. As I've noted, the process is similar if no candidate for the vice president receives a majority of votes. The person having the greatest number of votes as vice president shall be vice president if such number be a majority of the whole number of electors appointed, and if no person have a majority, then from the two highest numbers on the list, the Senate shall choose the vice president, and a quorum for the purpose shall consist of two-thirds of the whole number of senators and a majority of the whole number shall be necessary to a choice. Notice the Senate doesn't vote by states because, well, the states have equal representation in the Senate. Now, only after the decisions have been made as to who will be the new president and vice president are they legally considered president-elect or vice president-elect. These positions have absolutely no power, but we recognize this as a time for them to work on their transition to office at the inauguration. According to Section 1 of the 20th Amendment, the terms of the president and the vice president shall end at noon on the 20th day of January, and the terms of senators and representatives at noon on the 3rd day of January of the year in which each such term would have ended if this article had not been ratified, and the terms of their successors shall begin. So before their terms begin, the president and vice president must take an oath or affirmation of office. The president's oath is specified in Article 2, Section 1, Clause 8 of the Constitution. Before he enter on the execution of his office, he shall take the following oath or affirmation. 
I do solemnly swear or affirm that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Then, and only then, does the United States have a new president. If I could go back in time and explain to those visiting teammates how our presidential elections work, I would probably focus on three points. First, the political parties choose their candidates through a combination of primaries, caucuses, and internal negotiations. Second, the states elect the president based on the advice of their citizens. And third, the vast majority of the American people are unaware of points one and two. While many people say knowledge is power, that's not actually true. Knowledge only has power if it's used for some action. Now that you have the knowledge and a better understanding of how the United States elects a president, I hope you will use it to exercise your power as a United States citizen. Use this knowledge to push for your state to accurately portray who is being voted for on election day. Demand that they follow the Constitution in the appointment of their electors for president. Last, and probably most important, choose wisely who you vote for as a presidential elector. So while the election of presidents seems to be convoluted, and a lot of people don't understand things like the Electoral College and the fact that we don't have a national popular vote, there's a reason for that. And the fundamental reason is the people do not elect the president because he's not there to work for the people. The states elect the president because that's his job. He's the executive of the Union of States. That's his job. So hopefully when people start talking about, oh, we need the national popular vote and, and the Electoral College needs to be gotten rid of, I hope you'll have a better understanding of why, they, why we don't have a national popular vote and why the, what, we, what we call the Electoral College is so important. What we call the Electoral College is literally the states voting for president. It is the only national election. It's the only federal election that actually exists in this country. I know you've been taught all sorts of things that are different. I was too. Those are lies. That's why I go back to the facts and data. I go to the Constitution, I go to the law, and I show it to you. If you want the links that I use, well, the article is available on the website constitutionstudy.com. You can find a lot other information about the Constitution Study, keep track of what we're doing, sign up for a mailing list, ask a question. Hey, maybe you can join our Patriots program. You can take the boot camp for free. Just check it all out at constitutionstudy.com slash patriots. Most of all, I hope this opened your eyes that what you've been taught about the presidential elections is a lot of fiction. That knowledge can be powerful. It can change how you think of the president, how you think of the election process, and who knows, maybe even how you vote. But it's only powerful if you use it. That's what the Patriots program is about, helping people build the, the skills, the tools to use this knowledge. Now, if you find any of this interesting, well, I hope you come back and join us next time for the Constitution Study. Love the neighbors and have a few good friends.